Good afternoon, and welcome to TMLT's webinar series on HIPAA compliance, cyber risk, and cybersecurity. Today, we're going to be focusing on auditing information systems activities. Our slides are not advancing. Cassie, would you see if you can do that? Actually, while we go through our disclaimer, I'll just run through this uh, and pull up the, the previous version here. Uh, so welcome to our webinar. Sorry about that. And the um, our speakers for today, I'm Kathy Bryant, and I am the manager of TMLT's Product Development and Consulting Services. And I'm Cassie Turner. I am a senior risk management representative in the TMLT Risk Management Department, and I also um, assist Kathy with some risk assessments and um, things related to HIPAA. We provide for you just a disclaimer that the information and the opinions in this presentation are supplemental material. We are not attorneys and we are not providing legal advice. In this webinar, we're going to cover what you should consider when you start thinking about your audits for of your information systems activities, how you need to have written policies and procedures, and review what is needed if the OCR uh, ever asks for evidence of your information systems audits. When I think about information systems activity audits, I think back to what HIPAA's real intent was, which is to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of protected health information, regardless of the format. And your doing information systems activity audits helps you to know exactly who is accessing your protected health information, especially the electronic protected health information, and to guarantee that those who access it have a right to do so. So let's start with a polling question. How often do you review your information systems activities? You have choices there of annually, quarterly, monthly, or never. We'll give you just a second to um, to actually look at some of those answers. You simply have to click on the little circle by the answer in order to make your selection. So for those of you who answered never or annually, maybe after the presentation today, you'll rethink that decision of how often you're auditing. Because if we look at the large breaches reported to the federal government since 2009, you can see that there has been a steady increase in by year of the number of unauthorized access or disclosure incidents. In fact, 2018 was the largest ever. And so you can see that the, the unauthorized access is a huge problem. And it drives home the importance of monitoring information systems activity. 
So what does the security rule ask of you all? Um, and what does the rule say? And what does the OCR expect whenever we're looking at monitoring our systems and activity review? Um, we have for you here the rule and where you can find it if you want to refer to it at a later date. Um, this standard has no implementation specifics. However, it does tell us as covered entities to implement procedures to regularly review records of information systems activity, such as audit logs, access reports, security incident trafficking. Um, one example where this rule was cited in a settlement was the Anthem breach, which you may have heard of. It's the largest breach. It was a $16 million um, fine from the OCR because there were um, unauthorized individuals accessing this system. It was actually through a spear phishing campaign. Um, the hackers were within the IT system from December of 2014 until January of 2015, and they um, were able to steal the data of 78.8 million individuals. And the OCR cited this 164.308 as a failure to implement regularly review of records. Um, in addition, unfortunately, of this particular case, uh, Anthem had to settle a class action lawsuit of an additional $115 million um, on behalf of the uh, victim's damages from this breach. Again, the rule is does not have specifics. It leaves flexibility so that you are able to create something that is reflective of your organization. It asks you as an administrative safeguard to manage the conduct of a covered entity's workforce in relation to protections of that information. So are you looking at logins for your EHR, computer logins, network logins? Um, these are just a few examples. Practice management, billing systems. Where are your employees, where are they at within um, touching the EPHI, and how are you managing that and monitoring that? And then audit controls, again, it's important to note the security rule does not define a specific set of data that you must be capturing in all of your audit trails. However, it does ask you to consider where are your risks and what are the organizational factors that affect you specifically? What is your technical infrastructure? What hardware are you using? What software capabilities do you have? All of this is what you want to look at to desert to determine a reasonable and appropriate audit control for your information. Again, there's a lot of flexibility. It's kind of vague, which is kind of daunting at the same time. But it's given that flexibility so that you are able to do um, specifically what is reflected in your organization. And within, that's with the security rule. We also have to look at what does the privacy rule say in regards to this as well. Um, again. They're going to ask in the privacy rule for safeguards, and that is saying that you must have administrative, technical, and physical safeguards to protect your information. This includes any actions or practices such as securing locations or equipment, implementing solutions to mitigate risk, and also workforce training and sanctions. This is everything from how are you locking your doors, restricting areas um, that have PHI, antivirus software, encryption, firewalls, mobile device management. Um, again, you're looking at where is the, P the EPHI or protected health information and how are you protecting it um, at every touch point. And again, here's the an additional rule, the privacy rule of the administrative requirements, as Kathy mentioned earlier, about policies and procedures. Um, again, the rule is flexible, and they want your policies and procedures to be reflective of what you are actually doing within your particular organization. Some things may not make sense for you to address. For example, if you all are not using mobile devices, then having encryption on a mobile device may not make sense for you. So you'll want to look at the things that you are actually doing. Um, one of the breaches that we're going to talk about here was an online calendar for scheduling. If you're using an online calendar, then you'll want to be looking at those types of things. Not everyone is using those. So again, look at what you're using and take into account um, what, what tools and software and hardware, et cetera, equipment that you guys are using specifically within your organization. 
As Cassie said, there's a great deal of flexibility within the HIPAA rules for what you should be looking at. But you can also tell that it's very important to determine if your EPHI or PHI is being accessed or disclosed in an inappropriate manner. You simply have to know who's accessing your data and make sure that it is being accessed by authorized users. And as Cassie said, it doesn't just have to be your EHR. It can be your network in general, your entire practice management, or your practice management systems, or any other device that create, receive, maintain, or transmit EPHI. Clearly, there's no one way to, to make one rule that everyone has to fit the audit model. Your practices auditing activities will not be the same as anyone else's because your practice is unique and you have to determine where your vulnerabilities are and where you need to be looking. So let's take another polling question. What information do you think the OCR would request in the event of an investigation? Again, simply click the circle next to your response. EHR audits only, audits of all your systems that contain EPHI. They would only be asking for your policy and procedure. They would only be asking for your risk assessment or all of the above. Looks like most people are catching on that all of the above would be the correct response. We're going to start by taking a look at an actual OCR letter that a medical practice received after a hacking incident. In this, one of the requests was, please provide evidence that the covered entity has implemented policies and procedures. There again, policies and procedures are written. To ensure that the covered entity regularly reviews records of information system activity, such as audit logs, access reports, and security incident tracking. Another request for, for please provide evidence that the covered entity has implemented procedures for guarding against detecting and reporting malicious software. And lastly, please provide evidence that the covered entity has implemented hardware, software, and or procedural mechanisms that report and examine the activity in information systems that contain EPHI and include any policies regarding this implementation. So they're pretty specific in their requests for what they want and they expect that all covered entities would have all of these pieces of information available to send to them in the event of an audit or an investigation. We've hit on policies and procedures a couple of times. I can't stress enough how you can have the best process in place, but if it hasn't been committed to writing and you get an OCR investigation, they're going to want those policies and procedures to be written down. And they expect that they're not just a template that you ordered off the internet. They expect that those policies and procedures are going to say exactly what you do, who's going to do the review, what will be reviewed, how often it will be reviewed, and things like assigning uh, uh, where 
the logs are going to be filed and the reviews are all helpful as well. This is just an example of a part of a policy that we found on the internet. It starts out that the organizational shall, which remember shall means it's not optional, you must do it, review logs of ac access and activity. And it goes on to talk about the security rule and making a good faith effort to safeguard your information. Please note this is not the entire policy. This is an example of a chart that a practice came up with to actually have a, a diagram of what they were going to be reviewing and who was going to do it. Let's take a closer look at exactly what they're looking at. So they have something called a network web route report. That report monitors attempted access to the network. So if someone is not an authorized user and they're just sending out repeated attempts like hackers might do, um, there should be in many cases, there is a system in place if you have a managed service provider that they pick up on those failed login attempts. Things like your EHR successful logins, login log, log out activity, um, failed logins. You know, it may, a failed login doesn't mean someone's trying to hack your system. It may mean that someone just forgot their password. Each EHR is going to be different in what you can audit. And so if you don't know what your system's capabilities are, get with the vendor. They can certainly help you find the reports you need. So this example is one we made up. It's a very simplified audit of active users. So this is how they would do it. On a periodic basis, let's say monthly, they ran a list from their payroll of all their active workforce members. They got their IT or MSP to run a list of all the network users. And they had the EHR administrator run a list of all the current EHR users. And you simply go through and compare those. And about three-fourths of the way down on the chart, you'll see that Ernie Everest only appears in the network user list. And he's not on the payroll or in the EHR. This may be perfectly normal. This may be that Ernie only works for your managed service provider. And he only needs access into your network to look at your server if there's a problem. So this would not necessarily be a problem. You just have to look at those exceptions. On the other hand, we have Fran Franklin, who is not on the workforce member list or the network user list. In this case, Fran was a previous workforce member when she left the practice, she was had her access terminated from the network. And also, uh, she's not any longer on the payroll. So in this case, that one should raise a red flag so that you would be able to actually have someone look into why Fran actually has access. But now let's say you ran a report on a, a very well-known patient, which is another way that you can do access audits. And you can see that several years ago, Fran Franklin uh, made an appointment for this famous patient, Mickey Mouse. And it seemed like in 2016, everything was going along fine. But then there's a gap in time where there's no activity. 
And a couple of weeks ago, Fran Franklin accessed Mickey's uh, EHR and actually printed their demographics remotely. This could signal a real problem in that, number one, Fran is no longer with the practice, so she should not have access to the EHR. And secondly, that Fran is now accessing demographic information on your famous patients could indicate a problem. This is an example of a possible network login monitoring that your managed service provider could be providing. I know this dashboard is a little difficult to read um, and that the main thing that it's trying to show is that there are your managed service providers do have software tools that they use to help them monitor your networks for things such as EHR login attempts. So here is another example of a audit log um, that we have here for you. This is out of a practice management system. It shows log in, log out. It shows the activities that were done. And this is just a sample of something um, that you could run out of your practice management system or other systems. Um, again, we were talking earlier about uh, just monitoring those things that your folks have access to in your organization. Um, we mentioned the uh, calendar, web-based calendar. There was a fine that was just recently um, put forth by the OCR for $111,000 because access to a web-based scheduling calendar was not terminated for a former employee. About 557 patients' EPHI was compromised, which led to the $111,000 fine. Um, additionally, this uh, organization was um, uh, cited for not having a business associate agreement, so that's something to always keep in mind as well. And again, we have another example for you of an uh, log that you can run from your EHR. Most EHRs have the ability to run logs or audits of users and their activities. So you can see um, the user column when the time in and log out. And also, you should be able to see other items that the uh, user is doing and activities that they are partaking in whenever they are in the EHR. So as we've been saying, what are things to consider? What audit control mechanisms are reasonable and appropriate for your organization? As Kathy mentioned, it's really not a one size fits all. It will be unique to your organization, the types of systems that you're using, the types of tools and software that you're using, the type of equipment that you have. And so what are the capabilities found within each of those? And do you implement audit controls um, that are supporting your policies and procedures, as Kathy mentioned as well. Those need to be specific to what you're doing, not just templated um, or something that maybe your EHR provider has given to you, but they need to be specific to what you're doing. Again, you're going to take into consideration the various specifics of your organization and make those things um, match up with what, with what all you have in your organization. And in closing here, what are we trying to avoid? Uh, as with all of these uh, HIPAA privacy and security rules, we don't want to have an investigation by the Security of Health and Human Services. We want to avoid fines and penalties by the OCR. Uh, we want to make sure that there's not reputational harm um, in what's going on. You'll see here uh, that recently on on November the 7th, the OCR imposed a $1.6 million civil penalty against Texas Health and Human Services. Um, this breach occurred because some information, an internal application was moved from a private secure server to a public server, and they were not monitoring that server activity, and it was uh, an unauthorized person accessed uh, the EPHI of about 6,700 individuals. Um, so again, just making sure that there are audits 
in place that you're monitoring all your systems. And again, looking at where your EPHI lives, where is it transmitted, where is it stored, asking how is it moving, who is looking at it, uh, what equipment. Um, and if you're not sure quite where to start, we have included a plan of information system activity in the download file. That may be helpful for you to start because it can feel a little bit overwhelming with so many touch points of all of the data in the EPHI. Uh, so hopefully that will help you to get a start um, and develop a plan where you can quickly identify your threats. Hopefully in the long run you will save time and save money by avoiding a, a fine or a penalty uh, from the OCR. So we would like to thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, the slides and reference materials, as we've mentioned, are available in the download file uh, on the side of your screen. You'll also receive an email with the recording. If you have any questions, please feel free to put those into the Q&A pod um, at this time, or you can email those to consulting at tmlt.org as well. While we're waiting for questions to come in, I would just uh, remind you all that our next month's webinar is moved up a week because of the Christmas holidays. It will be a very interesting discussion with a physician who has survived an OCR investigation. And we hope that you can join us for that on December 17th. That um, particular webinar uh, registration is already live, and you should be able to cl click on the link on this slide, Surviving an OCR Investigation, and register for it now. In addition to being uh, ma mailed, emailed all of the uh, recorded webinars for joining us today as well as the resources, our webinars are all available on the TMLT Resource Hub as well as YouTube. And if you want to pass any of the links on to colleagues or uh, others in the profession that you think might benefit from them, feel free to do so. Not seeing any more. Oh, maybe there is a question. Uh, what is a managed service provider, and can you provide an example of one, please? A managed service provider is an IT company that does more than just install equipment and keep it running. A managed service provider contract typically includes things like they're going to uh, monitor your network traffic. They're going to make sure that your, um, your antivirus and anti-malware software is current and up to date on all of your PCs. They're going to make sure that all of your applications that you allow on your systems currently are with the, the most current um, version so that you don't have vulnerabilities that you don't know. Every managed service provider contract can be slightly different, but the basic thing is they're doing more for you than just an IT guy that would come in and fix your printer if it's not working, for instance. The other thing is that if uh, you actually are uh, paying an MSP to do this monitoring, you might as well take advantage. You're already paying for it to be done. Just make sure they're sending you a report. Let's see, if we already have eClinical storing our data, do we need to do anything else? 
Yes, even if you have ECW or eClinicals, if you're storing it in their cloud, you are still responsible for knowing who's accessing it because there's no assurance that their systems cannot be breached as well. And you want to make sure that someone's not in your data that is not uh, actually being uh, being there in inappropriately. Um, as far as the next question about do we have a list of managed service providers, we we do not have a list and we do not endorse managed service providers. We have seen we have worked with a number around the state. So if you'll email consulting at tmlt.org and tell us where you are, if we know of managed service providers in that area, we'll be happy to share those with you. There's one other question. Uh, do you have a resource of some templates that can be used as a starting point. Um, if you look in the download file, there is a plan of information systems activity PDF. This hopefully will is a grid that will hopefully uh, provide a, a starting point for you and places where you can start thinking about where is my um, EPHI living, how is it moving, who's touching it, what equipment do we have. Those are some of the basic questions that you'll want to start just as globally. Um, where is it living? How is this data being transmitted? Where is it being stored? What equipment do I have and who's touching it um, and various points. So hopefully that document will help you with the starting point. And as you get started, if you do have a question you want to reach out to us specifically about in follow-up, certainly consulting at tmlt.org uh, is monitored and, and we do answer questions all the time. So feel free to use that email if you do. If you, How do you yeah, go ahead, Kathy. I was going to say you click on whatever number or whichever um, document you want to download. There's four different ones, and click the download files at the bottom. It's light gray. Most people think that means it's grayed out and not accessible. But if you click on the document, so it's blue, and then download files, uh, that would allow you to download those. You can always just Google HIPAA security series. There's actually six different documents in that series, and we've only highlighted part or two parts of it today. Is there a recommendation on how often audits should be performed? Um, I was talking to someone yesterday who actually said that they do them daily. They obviously are using an automated tool that runs their reports for them. Um, I think daily is ideal because if someone hacks you tonight, you'd like to know about it tomorrow. But um, certainly on a, um, a monthly basis is probably reasonable if you're a very small practice and that is labor intensive for you. If you feel like you have your security well in place, perhaps quarterly, but annually would be way too far out. Because this is in the example of Anthem that uh, Cassie talked about in the beginning. They were a huge organization with tons of resources. And they 
let their hacker oh, I, it, or their hacker was in their system today, and we look for to over you a month. year undetected. And so the idea is to shorten that time as small as possible.